All right, today's giveaway is exciting because it's literally the most advanced workout program we have. In fact, it's one of the only programs that comes with a warning. This program is called MAPS PED, Performance Enhanced Design. It's a double split routine. So if you're a workout fanatic, you got good genetics, you recover well, you got a good diet, you get good sleep, this program is extreme, but it can produce extreme results. And that's the program I'm giving away for free. Right now, here's how you can enter to get free access to MAPS PED. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and then click your notifications on. Turn that on. If you do all those three things and if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS PED. One more thing before we get started with this incredible show. We are running a promotion right now on three workout bundles. Each bundle gives you nine months of planned out workouts, nine months of sets and reps and exercises and video demos, okay? Each bundle gives you nine months, but there's three bundles. One of them is suitable for you. The first one is for beginners. The second one is for those of you that are intermediate. And the third one is for those of you that are advanced, okay? So we have a bundle for everybody, nine months of programming, discounted heavily. It's like 70% off the normal price. If you're interested, head over to mapsjanuary.com. Click on the bundle that's right for you and sign up. Also, if you just want to try one MAPS program, you just want to do one, you want to see what all the fuss is about, do MAPS Anabolic. It's the flagship program. That program by itself is 50% off. You can sign up at mapsred.com. You got to use the code though, January 50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. The best way to improve functional flexibility is to lift weights. All right. Let's talk about this a little bit. All right, well, let's define uh, functional flexibility and how is it mm. different than regular flexibility. I haven't heard that term in a while. Yeah. It used to be the buzz so, term of the yes. day. It, so there's, there's a myth out there that resistance training makes you tight, um, you lose mobility, right? The, the myth of the stiff, you know, tight bodybuilder who's got really bad flexibility. So, I, you know, what you said, Adam, is I think is important. We have to define functional flexibility. So... Regular flexibility is your ability to move through or, or, or be moved through a wide range of motion. So if I'm on the floor, let's say, and let's say Justin grabs my leg and tests my hamstring flexibility, passively he would bring my leg up and bring it you know, far back or whatever, oh, and that would be my, my flexibility. Oh, yeah. Functional flexibility is different. Functional flexibility is flexibility you, you control it through that, that you own. Yeah. Flexibility that you have strength through. So uh, I like to use this example, right? I have a, a 15 month old son. He's extremely flexible. I mean, I could bring his feet and put them by his head and twist them and do all kinds. Of, but he's got almost no functional flexibility, right? Because he has no strength. Yeah. Flexibility without control and strength is instability. It's actually one of the the highest risks of injury is being hyper flexible but also being weak. Now, proper mm. resistance training, and I say proper because this is the important thing to understand. Tra you train in a very full range of motion, and the goal is to increase your ranges of motion through proper mobility training and proper application of exercise. But when you train in those full ranges of motion, you improve your flexibility, but you're stronger in it. So not only can you know you sit in a squat, but you can do it with weight, and you can get out of it if you need to very quickly versus just being flexible without strength, which is totally unstable, and a, again, yeah. a recipe for, for injury. The best example of this that... I have ever seen in myself that like blew my mind was one of the first times that we <coughs> hung out with Dr. Brink and uh, he told me to sit down in a 90, 90 position, which you guys have seen me probably do on the YouTube channel a, a bunch of times. And uh, he grabbed my back leg and he took it and he lifted it like yeah, rot like, like internally rotated yeah. and brought your foot up too. Yeah, almost took, right, to hit your butt. Did the same yeah, thing to me. All the way up, like I was uh, looking at it. So I'm, I'm I'm sitting here in the 90 90 position. He brings my heel up and I'm looking at my foot, going like, "Holy shit! I did not know that I have that much flexibility." And then he lets it go and he's okay. Now bring it back up to yourself. And I, it's like I, you yeah. know, like a half an inch. I could bring it off the ground and that was it. So that and was it, flexibility versus what you right. actually own. Right, right. So and it just kind of blew my mind that I technically have that flexibility, mm -hmm. but I've lost all the control and strength. It's not usable in that in that range of motion. And that's I was like, wow. And there's an examples of that with every joint, right? Yeah. Everybody has that. But that was the the greatest expression that I'd ever seen someone or had someone show to me how much I was lacking in that area. He did, he did the same thing to me. And it was strange because I, I was the same thing. He brought my foot way up here and I looked at it and I felt detached. 
mm-hmm. was like I was looking at another foot. Yeah. Now to take it a step further, imagine being put in that position and then someone jump on you or you have to get out of that position real quick on your own. You will tear yeah. your hip. Injury. You will injure right your knee. You'll yeah. injure yourself. So, and if you, you know, think about this, right? Imagine somebody's stretching your, just your pack. This is an area that most people don't really think about, but imagine bring your arm back as far as you possibly can or someone bring it back and then you have to explode out of that position or move, right? You wouldn't mm-hmm. do it because you know, you know, instinctively that would tear that would hurt my, that's the difference well, between flexibility and functional flexibility. This is why a lot of, uh, you know, like if we go back to our certifications and we look at all the limitations in terms of the degrees of range of motion where they stop you because of safety protocol, it like had to throw all that out because like w- that really wasn't preparing a lot of the athletes I was training for success on the field. In fact, it was limiting their abilities substantially in terms of them, uh, because when you're actually moving and, and aggressively moving on the field and, and all these different variables and different ways that you're controlling your body, you're in pretty, pretty crazy angles. And you have to be able to know how to navigate and have access uh, to that range of motion in order and be strong in that range of motion in order to thrive as an athlete. Yeah, so. I remember when there were some breakthrough studies that came out that flipped what we thought we knew on its head in regards to warming up. In the 80s and I'd say early to mid 90s, the way you warmed up before a game or before a competition was you did static stretching. You would sit in a hamstring stretch and then hold your quad, do a stretch, and then do a hip flexor stretch and do all this static stretching. And this was just standard, you know, in PE class is how we warmed up. And this is what you would see athletes doing before a competition. Then a study came out that showed that static stretching before competition increases risk, increases risk of injury, reduces performance and increases risk risk of injury. And you think to yourself, Mm -hmm. how is this possible? Like I get looser. When I static stretch, how am I hurting myself? Because this is what happens. When you stretch a muscle and you hold a stretch, the muscle isn't becoming looser or longer. You're not, it's not like rubber where rubber's cold and it's not flexible and you warm it up and it gets more elastic. That's not how it works. What it literally is, is your central nervous system keeps a muscle tight. And when you hold a stretch long enough, it sends a signal to the CNS, tells it to relax. And then it kind of loosens its grip on that muscle, allowing it to stretch out uh, further. So static stretching temporarily increases your flexibility and your range of motion by shutting off the CNS a little bit. So now you go off on the extra on the field and you run and you're kicking or you're jumping and you move in a new range of motion you normally wouldn't because your CNS now has allowed that muscle to elongate a little more, but you have no strength mm-hmm. in that new range of motion. Boom, injuries are more common. So they found like stretching the hamstrings, static mm-hmm. stretching, caused more hamstring pulls than when people did nothing at all. This was compared to nothing at all. Now, of course, there's a superior way to warm up, and that's dynamic and priming, which is turning the CNS yeah. on. There's just a massive difference between passive and active. Yes. Uh, which is where you know the active is really where they found the, the most benefit uh, when, when you're approaching a lot of these types of like ranges of motion. Can I have access to that? Can I control my body to, to go in and out of these degrees of angles that are a little bit like further than um, you know these 90 degrees sort of stops? Yes, and also when you're thinking about everyday life, um, you need, you don't need lots of flexibility. You need functional flexibility. Like the, to be able to get into the splits, it's not really valuable in everyday life. But being able to squat down or rotate, well, let's say your kid spills something in the back of the car and you got to turn real fast, or you're walking and you step off a curb or you lose your footing a little bit and you move in a new range of motion, but you got to control it and have some connection to that so you don't hurt yourself. That's the important kind of flexibility that you need. Now, the super long ranges of motion, they can come in value. They, they can be valuable for certain sports, but in those sports, you still need, like, for example, if you're a Taekwondo, uh, you know, if you practice Taekwondo, for example, and you need to do these really high kicks, you need that range of motion, but that range of motion is worthless if you can't bring your leg up yourself and you can't right, right. control that range of motion. So, Static stretching does have a place in improving functional flexibility, but it has to be combined with some kind of resistance. But if you compare head to head, you know, traditional flexibility type exercises and programs, and traditional being mostly static stretching, to good full range of motion appropriate resistance training, the functional flexibility from resistance training is superior, will result in less injuries, will make people feel more stable in their everyday lives. 
It will decrease the the uh, you know pain in everyday life, everyday life more than just improving uh, flexibility. So there's the myth of. By the way, the reason why you see some people who do a lot of resistance training who are very tight, because I know people are watching right now saying, "Well, no, that's true. That's you know part of that is not true." Because I know bodybuilders, and let me tell you, I got I know a guy who can't even wipe his own butt. He's so right. so tight. Part of it is there's muscle gets in the way when you're massive. But here's the other part. When people train in shortened ranges of motion. Yeah, and which a lot of bodybuilders do. That's right. When you do that, you build strength in a short range of motion, which means it's disproportionate to the range of motion that you that you maybe don't own, but that you have. So you essentially make yourself tighter. In other words, if I only do quarter squats and I get really strong with quarter squats, I am going to move very tightly because my body's going to know you get outside that quarter squat position, you have no strength, you have no stability. No. So when I say functional flexibility with resistance training, I'm referring to appropriate and full ranges of motion and making that a priority with your training. That's what will give you that functional flexibility. It also build a lot more muscle that way too. That's true. I, you know, and, and you have to. I remember when I so I used to I used to be the you know, ninety degree bench press guy. For oh, that's a what long we learn in our service. yeah. So for a long time. And then I remember uh, reading and, and learning how important it was for me to take these joints through full range of motion and then get into the place where I would do a bench press where I brought like dumbbells all the way down. Myself. And initially I was weaker. So initially doing that, I had to pull back. I was able to back then I was doing like 100, 110 pound dumbbells. I had to scale all the way back to like 80 pound dumbbells was now my, my, like my new max. But it didn't take long for that to ca catch up. And then when I finally got to the place where I was now pressing that same weight that I was pressing before, or in the shortened range of motion, I had more muscle than yes. I had built. So there's tremendous value besides like health and protecting your joints. There's also those that are paying attention that like, all I want to do is build this amazing physique. Well, you'll actually build a better physique if you take the, the your body through its fullest range yeah, of motion. Yeah, there's also. um uh there was a debate uh maybe 20 years ago where they would say, you know, maybe partial reps are more effective. True, you can't get a full range of motion, but because you can load partial reps so much more that offsets the fact that you're not doing a full range of motion and therefore you should be able to build more muscle. In fact, there was a whole book that was sold on this and it was mm -hmm. about, you know, lifting in these quarter half ranges of motion, but just maxing out the weight and yeah. they tried to sell it. No studies actually show even when you do that, it doesn't matter. Fuller ranges of motion. Uh, if you compare head to head, just build more muscle. Head to head and long term. Cause long, you could, you course. could show a study that shows, you know, somebody who's training in this light, full range of motion and you put them in yeah, a small six weeks of that yeah, small six week window where you overload you know more than 100 110 percent of what they would normally yeah. be doing through full range of motion absolutely novelty the body's going to adapt it's going to show it's going to build some muscle mm -hmm. so that's how they, they cherry pick stuff like that and to try and uh, you know prove their point but the truth is over an extended period of time you know training through a full range of motion is going to yeah. benefit you not only health wise but then also for building muscle speaking of exercise a cool study just came out that kind of confirmed what we've talked about before on the podcast and what strength athletes have observed in the past. So they took a group of men and they broke them up into two groups and they had one group do uh, eight sets of 10 reps to failure of the bench press one time in the day. Then they had the other group do four sets in the morning and four sets in the evening. Oh, so they broke it up. They broke it up. Same so, amount of volume. Though. Same volume, everything the same. All they did is increase the frequency. So they increased the frequency in training. Here's what they found. Breaking it up was better. Lower levels and rates and markers of, uh, of damage. Faster recovery. Yep. They saw faster recovery, and it pointed to the fact that they would probably build more muscle and more strength by doing the same amount of volume, just splitting, just splitting it up it out. with more frequency. Now, you guys remember those all-day workouts I would experiment uh -huh, with? Uh -huh. that's, ex that's exactly what I would notice. It was It's the strangest thing. And for people who, who – those are older episodes. What I did – I have a garage gym, so this is probably uh, – th this might be challenging for someone who has to go to a gym and do this unless you have a whole day of nothing to do. Mm -hmm. But what I did on the weekend is often in the weekend I would be writing content for Mind Pump, which meant I'm at home on my computer anyway. And so what I did was is I worked out – every other hour starting at 9 a.m. And I think I finished at like 6 p.m. And what I would do is three exercises. I would do uh, three sets of each and I would do like five reps. And it was like moderate intensity. And I did, I think I did like squat, uh, mm -hmm. bench and row or something like that. And I would do it at 9 a.m. And then I do it again at 11 a.m. And so on. And it was the strangest thing. 
uh, when I added up the total volume, way more volume than I would ever do in a workout. It was like a tremendous amount of volume, but I did not feel at all like I did tons of volume. I felt good. I actually saw myself get stronger within the day. So by the third or fourth workout, I was getting stronger. So I noticed my CNS was kind of, and, the, and then the following workouts, which went back to more traditional stuff. I actually got some gains, and I was like, holy cow, this is very interesting. I, mean, I, think- I wish we had the luxury to <laughs> do that uh, frequently, you know, uh, and spread that out. Because I've actually – I've noticed the same thing, and I don't know – uh, you know, if the component there is that y- you're teaching your central nervous system, okay, here's the movement that we're we're seeking today, and like, and it gets better at it. And then I stop right before I get like the damage and the, and the fatigue, and then I repeat that again, and it, it recognizes that again. And so now I'm stronger in that movement, you know, because I I just I found myself getting stronger throughout the day as I yes. spread it out. Yes. So I, I I think it's that I think the big piece though is the damage piece. And I, that's why I wanted to say that there's there's a challenging piece to what you what you're talking about right now, and the challenging piece is that people still think that the the where it's at is this do a ton of damage and then rest and let your body recover. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't, if you go into those little mini like what's called micro workouts because they're only probably twenty yeah. minutes or less long and they're very moderate to low intensity. Uh, where people will be challenged is they will want to apply their intensity in their normal 50 minute in that little 20 minute yeah. and you can't you got to just you got it's and why it's deceiving is you'll do it and you'll feel like oh that was easy i really didn't do much yeah. Yeah. and the and what, what what you'll see people do is then they'll they'll try and emulate it and then the, but then they'll ramp up the intensity oh i could do a lot yeah. more weight or right. i could do a few yeah. more reps to, to give you an idea i it's would not quite as satisfying yes. yes so to give you an idea uh like uh squats um if i were going to do five reps Back then, I would do about maybe 315, and that would be in a normal workout, right? I brought the weight down to 255, and I was doing five. So just give you an example of uh, that I went lighter. Yeah. But again, I was doing three sets you know, every other hour of that weight, and uh, so the volume was just through the roof. Yeah. One of the reasons why I think they see improved recovery overall and less muscle damage overall <laughs> is I think that there's this – cumulative effect with uh, with damage if you don't allow your body to have some recovery in between, whereas damage then starts to cause more damage. So in other words, you're causing these inflammatory markers, you're damaging your body, and then because you keep going, subsequent damage on top of the damage that you just caused is more damaging, essentially. But if you do some and then rest, because what they did is they did the four sets in the morning, right. waited four sets in the afternoon that the damage they did the second workout wasn't as bad as it would have been had they done it all together. Yeah. And that's what they're finding. And this is how, you know, a lot of bodybuilders used to train. They used to do double split routines. They used to get yeah. way better results. Olympic lifters. Olympic lifters mm-hmm. at the highest level, they work out several times a day. They'll do some sets and then they'll come back later, do some sets. The problem some- with the bodybuilders though is they they're applying their intensity philosophy in both those workouts though. And that's the and they're also hyped up. Most of them are on anabolics, so but they still recovering. saw the benefit. Sure, of splitting sure. things and out, and that right? I mean that just speaks to your frequency point. Yeah, but I think they're their recovery up like artificially. I think w- people listening right now that are going to go try and attempt to do this, I think the number one mistake that will be made moderate will, intensity. That's right. You will are be not the going over. Al- in fact, I would encourage someone who tries this to lean towards oh, borderline easy. Borderline, like more like Olympic lifting, where you're just practicing 35, 40% intensity yeah. back way off. And I bet you see tremendous benefits more so than if you go after those, you know, four or five workouts in the day and you try and kind of get after it. Like yep. you got to resist that temptation of wanting to do it. And I think that it's what Justin's saying it's the, the practicing of that. And then it's also that you're you're minimizing the damage. And we, we've talked about this before, that your body's adapting and it's also recovering. If you always apply intensity and that's your main indicator of a good workout, then your body's just trying to recover all the it's time. Just it's not Yeah, it's not adapting and getting stronger where doing these little micro workouts, I think, helps bring back down the intensity by naturally. The, by the way, if you want to just get one lift better, like you're like, I just want to get my bench press better or my pull-ups better. Try it with just one exercise. Yeah. Every other hour, do uh, a few sets of an exercise with moderate intensity and do it maybe, you know, like I said, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., you know, one, three, five, and then maybe you're done or maybe another one at seven if you're feeling okay. And watch how much stronger you get literally not just that day, but the following couple of days. You'll add, like, let's say you have struggle with, with uh, pull-ups and you can't get past 10 reps. Do seven reps 
every other hour on one day or something like that. And then watch what happens. It's really a trippy thing to experience. I remember doing it and going, this is very, it felt so weird. Like by the third or fourth workout, I was stronger than I was with the first workout. It was very strange. Katrina mm-hmm. loves to work out like this now. So this is pretty much for the last two years almost is what her workout has looked like is she takes our programs and she breaks them up in these micro 10 minute increments because of max Smart. because she's got max. And mm-hmm. so it's like, okay, he's got it down. He's taking a nap right now. So I can go get a, a short little workout right now. Oh, he's, he's playing with his toys right now. So, and he's yeah. occupied. So I'll go get a couple more exercises and she just breaks it up through the day like that. And she loves it. She feels like it's less stressful. It doesn't feel like she has to carve out 50 to an hour and he has to be mm-hmm. fully entertained for so time. Like naturally charges up your energy. Levels. Totally. Yeah. If she feels great all day long, it's very easy for her to manage that. It's like ever, anyone who's had a child that's two years old knows that like keeping them entertained for 10 minutes, realistic, keeping them entertained for for an hour straight, hard. a lot harder yeah. to do. So instead of stressing out that I got to get this hour block, she just goes, okay, I'm, I'm going to go do the squats yeah. right now. And yeah. I'll go do the presses later on. Yeah, I do like, three 15 or 20 minute workouts. Yeah. Or something like that. Totally. Yeah. I love that. Speaking of the kids, man, my, now I, I, I'm not, I, I'm trying not to project into this. He's still a baby, <laughs> <laughs> but I swear my 15 month the old signs are there. He loves like lifting shit. It's yeah. the strangest thing. He he has this like this walker that he'll run and I'll load it with shit. He loves it when I make it heavy. He mm-hmm. thinks it's even more fun. And then you know what he started doing the other day? Mm. He stands there. He looks at me. He he picks it up by the handle and he does reps. Ah, uh, ah, uh, and he just does reps and just yeah. looks at. And I'm looking at him like, what are you? You're doing like upright rows. Like, why are you doing that? Yeah. And he thinks it's the funniest thing ever. It's so. And Jessica will send me videos. Where he'll like he'll he'll have a toy that you're supposed to squeeze and it squirts out water, mm-hmm. and he'll squeeze it and then he makes this like little grit face and he's like he likes to apply <laughs> force to things. I'm That's like, this great. is so. That's do I great. have my little lifting buddy? I Did don't I just, know, man. You might. I, <laughs> I mean, I I didn't really see it coming either. Uh, Everett's been showing a lot of signs of it too, and just on his own, right? I've been again. I, I've tried my best to kind of stay stay back and not not put all of my uh hopes and dreams on top of him and and try and you know <laughs> push that on him right yeah because yeah, i really want it to happen but um so he he signed up for gymnastics and is going through all this kind of stuff and figuring out his body dude he just started his own thing he just decided 50 push-ups a night is like his thing 50 on it yeah he does 50 how old is he reps him out he's eight God. i mean sorry he just turned so nine yesterday what grade is that Fourth? Yeah. Fourth. Yeah. Fourth grade? Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, that is such a young age to, to have that kind of commitment. Yeah. It, and, and it's crazy. And so he got, he got like gift cards and stuff for his birthday and he spent it on um, this punching bag. And so he has like this little punching bag and he just like beats the shit out of it every night, does his push ups. <laughs> He's shredded. He's like jacked right now. And like, I'm just like, oh man. Now, any idea what's, uh, What's prompting him to do this now? Like, is is it like, because I, okay, fourth grade was my first, like, you know, girlfriend. You yeah. Know, where you just kind of hold hands or with that. Brad, you're int- right? You're interested in, uh, you're interested Brad. in the opposite sex <laughs> typically at that, at that yeah. point, right? Or you're yeah. starting to, right? So I, I wonder if he's like, part of it is that, like, he's now kind of getting interested in the opposite sex. And so he's wanting to. I think he wants uh, to, I think it's a his little older brother. Bit. I bet it's his older he, brother. It's his older brother. But also, too, he, he likes, being on top like he's he was really into and he still is really into um uh tetherball and so he takes that super seriously and i had to like build him the whole thing outside so he could like you know keep punching at it and he's like i'm number one right now dad and he's been like calling out all the older kids and now he's like (laughs) going against the sixth graders and everything and he's like beating the shit out of them and you know and so that's his thing but he it's funny because he has like serious performance anxiety when it comes to like um, performing like so he has a gymnastic competition this weekend mm. and he's just dreading it you know because he just he it has to be like can perfect. he be more you or what dude is there anything he's not exactly like you he's or what very much, you know i was dude, gonna ask like, very, like very, literally very spot similar. on you know I, I was gonna <laughs> ask you justin because there's a yeah. there's definitely a difference between performing in what you could call what you i guess could label as individual type sports versus team sports mm-hmm like I would get, I get nervous for competition no matter what. But I did not like competing in team sports. I I rather do individual sports, like I you know wrestling, and judo. I'm the opposite. And uh, there's a lot of people the opposite. Yeah, they don't want to go out on the mat by themselves, but they prefer to go out with their team. Totally, totally. Right. So I'm wondering if he's because you are a team sport guy. I'm a team sport guy. Yeah, and I've been trying to 
to prod him into like looking into going back to soccer and basketball, baseball. Mm -hmm. He's just like, he really loves gymnastics. He's, he's kind of like, he really likes what's happening with his body and he likes like how he has all these new abilities and he can just, you know, pop up and do a handstand or, you know, he can do like multiple flips on the trampoline and he, he they're also, they're hard, like, they're into the parkour thing too, right? Yeah, so very that's much. Co- yeah, that's cool. So we'll see. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm really trying to like move him in that direction um, because I know he, he'd do really well. He did really well when he played soccer. He's just not like focused on um, dominating in terms of like being on a team. And I'm like, this, that's where it's at. So let's, let's hear the prediction from you since your dad, when does, when does he catch up to his other his old his older brother, and when does it become mm. like a like a serious competitive? Because they're what nine and twelve, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so right now it's a big. I mean, that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ethan, but when they get older, it's not going to make yet, a difference yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, right now it's it. He's catching up, like strength wise. That's what I'm saying. So when you when you when when because it's to me knowing the two of them and kind of their personalities and what they're into. It's kind of it's you could tell the way it's playing out. Everett is going to be probably the more jock, even though they both like sports. Everett's going to be the more aggressive jock, mm-hmm. and he's the younger brother who's always trying to catch up. So there's going to come a time when they get really close to being equal and be competitive. I, my best friend is like has a younger brother who ended up you know kind of catching, and it, it took him till he was a freshman or sophomore in high school. When like we saw his younger, and we used to always my he, the older brother is my best friend, and so I always tease him. My little brother is fucking picking on yeah. you. Yeah, so let's do what you well, gonna- it, this is, must be a similar story because I I mean my brother is two years older than me, and and I totally caught him when I was in junior high. So it was junior high. Junior when high, like like seventh grade, I just completely you know I could take him <laughs> <laughs> anything anything besides. Ping pong. I'll give you ping pong. <laughs> you got me on that one. That really irritated me. And then, so that was so the only game he wanted to play. He's still mad about it. Yeah, dude. He, he usually gets me like like nine out of 10, yeah, right? Yeah. And that pisses me off. But yeah. Um, yeah, I was able to pretty much school him in basketball and everything else and uh, all the other physical sports. The physical, like demanding ones. Yeah, it's cool. You see your kids and they're just, they're just different. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't care. I just love, I love it when my kids have something that they're passionate about. And I really don't care what they're into. I could care less if, yeah, sure, I like to lift weights and that'll be cool, but I can be into almost anything. And I don't, I, I just like to see that there's something that, that they enjoy and that they're passionate about. Like I remember yeah. my older son, when he was doing robotics and they got to a high level and they were competing. I would, remember I, was, I would text you guys when I'd go to these tournaments yeah. and there'd be scouts like college scouts. And then they're like, there's like tech companies watching these kids. Mm-hmm. And I remember being there like, Hyped up, like, oh shit, dude! Come here, son. You, know, <laughs> you guys got to kick ass, dude. That's you know, Cisco's watching over there, and there's uh, Google, you know. And, <laughs> you know? Sick. It's just, it's just fun. It's fun to see, you know, your kids do stuff. But yeah, my my youngest is just, it's so weird. He likes to just push and lift and was he heavy now, things. Now, do you guys have him? Uh, does he in the garage a lot when you and Jessica are working out? Like, what, or does he not normally in there when you are? A little bit sometimes. Max is a lot. He, like, so Max uh, has been around we, that a lot because when we 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 throw him in the back of the truck, that's like the move, yeah. right? So we make that like a little playpen, and then Katrina and I can work out at the same time together, and Max is kind of running. No, around. he doesn't like to sit still for two. Like, if she puts him in the playpen with toys and works out, she'll get maybe ten minutes. So she can't do a full workout that way. Mm. So not really, which is why. This is very interesting to me. Like, if like I said, we yeah, have. So it's not like he's been watching dad like lift weights. No, also. Like, he like, naturally has it, dude, dude. If there's a heavy box <laughs> anywhere in the house, he'll get behind it and he'll try to push it. That's, and if it's that's hilarious, if it's against the wall, he'll he'll get my attention, wants me to move it so I can move it in the floor, and then he'll push it, and then I'll add stuff to it and then make it heavy as hell. And he'll sit there and strain against it and keep trying to push it. I'm like, what are you doing? I was dude? telling you that when, when I saw that those videos and stuff of Aurelius, I was telling you that. So my best friend, the one I was just talking about, his they have a son who's a year and a half, almost two years older than mine. And uh, they had this idea that because he was into like pushing things, very kind of aggressive boy for sure. And they, they had this long hallway. And his my buddy's logic was – before bedtime, they would tire him out, tire him out, yeah. and fuck him up. It is totally backfired. 
because and I and I know this from watching what I've done with my son. There be there was a time it wasn't that long ago, maybe like six months ago. If or you tire them out, you have to do it like two or three hours before. Yes, right before. If you bed, do it right before, amped. then you get their adrenaline going. Yeah, they're not going because I would like Katrina get mad at me if I would like uh, like one of my favorite things to do with Max before he gets ready to go to the bath is I because Katrina never lets him run around naked. I, I let him run around naked and he runs in the house and I chase him and stuff like that. Dude, and we, that's, that's and we wrestle and we act all stupid, right? So. <laughs> But she gets mad at me less about him being naked and more about you're winding him up. It's bath like mm -hmm. bath time has been trained as bath time. We're coming down, yeah. then we're reading time, and then it's bedtime. Yeah. And she's right. Like the few times that I've done that with him, it riles him up, and then it's always hard to get him down. So my buddy has trained his son to want to push and be aggressive, like at eight o'clock at night. So <laughs> soon now yeah, you got a rough house early. Oh in the yeah, day, dude. dude. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think if he could go back and do that all over again, no, that's what I do. He so. would have he would have done it a lot earlier than eight o'clock at night. No, because. You know? If, if my boy's going to bed at seven, I, I'll do it at five, it's like four or five. And yeah. you'll see me and him running around and I'll chase him. And he gets me tired, man. Sometimes I'm like, damn, dude, I don't want to keep doing this. But I know it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's good for him. So we have a we have a good time with it. But we'll see, man. I don't know. Because he's definitely, obviously, he, he doesn't have the same mom as my older kids. And my, and Jessica is, she's not like an athlete or super athlete or anything, mainly because she never tried. Yeah, but she's built like one. She is. Yeah, and she's mesomorph for sure. Mes she's a, she's a total classic mesomorph, right? Yeah. And now she never really played any sports, but the ones that she attempted, cause she thought they were cool. Like she did, um, the silks, which is like, if you ever watch these performers, well, they climb these freaking pieces of fabric with their hands and then they do the splits and do a bunch of weird shit. She got like to expert level in like a, a year and a half because she traveled with the Cirque du Soleil. She she worked for them and she would practice with these, and they were all remarking, you know, talking to her about how amazing she. He's got her genetics for sure. Yeah, I look at his yeah. muscle bellies and everything. He ain't an ectomorph like I was. No, no, you could tell. He's got the mesomorph no. mom. I keep you, telling her that yeah. she's like, shut up, don't say. It. I'm like, no, it's true, dude. He's got your genes. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Yeah, you and I both yeah. locked out like that, having, having <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> marrying right the second Athlete. time there for you yeah. for sure. Getting, yeah, getting, getting those, those, buff, those buff genetics that we wanted. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Because Max is a lot fuller than I was for sure. He's right? a big. Your boy's tall too. Yeah, he's, Aurelius is not that tall. He's yeah. just kind of you know. But. He's solid all the way around too. Like I was, I was very wiry and. And thin, like I was. Yeah, I go to pick up your son, and I'm like, "Oh, you're heavier than you." Than my I d my dad, my real dad, right? The one, uh, my biological dad was uh, when he was a freshman. He was 93 pounds, mm. so oh, wow. he was tiny. Yeah. yeah, he like he was a wrestler, swimmer. Was he tall though, like no, he was short too. Oh, okay. Well, not short. He was shorter than I am, right? Right. So yeah, he went. Uh, he was five right? ten. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I'm six three. So genetics are weird, man. Like you, you're talking about younger brothers. My younger brother is a horse. He's a beast. Like yeah. in terms of just, he just carries muscle and size like insane i mean yeah. i wish i had those those genetics. no when you see someone like your brother's a perfect example like this is how much genetics plays a role you have spent your whole life never missing a workout since you were like 15 years <laughs> yeah, old dude. and he's like you're gonna make me feel terrible he, he like never he rides a bike like is what he likes to do and then he'll, he'll come in the gym and he'll lift as much weight he'll go is, and he'll work out yeah. a little bit and yeah. then you know send me a video like oh is this a lot is this a good amount is of this, weight <laughs> like you're benching 315 is this a lot Can you, you, you remember you guys obviously met my cousin andy right my cousin andy is yeah i remember when i first like i didn't meet him until I was uh, 20 years old, I was managing Hillsdale, and he walked up to me and was like, "Hey, I'm your cousin." I didn't even know he's my like I'd never met that side yeah. of the family, and he knew from the last name. And I was working there, and he was like 16 or 17 years old. And I looked at him I'm like, "Are you sure, bro? <laughs> you look like you're sure related." <laughs> yeah, repping like 315, bro. When he was like 16, like I hadn't even hit that yet before. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> hey, <laughs> speaking of genetics, uh, there's a show on uh, HBO Max called Peacemaker with uh, John Cena. So so, did you guys watch? You guys didn't. You guys are dumb. You guys. Saw, were dumb. Yes. yes, you are. Yeah. By the way, you mean Doug and I like oh, good shows? No. You know what's funny? <laughs> you know how many DMs <laughs> I've gotten because you guys? There's certain because like, you have nerds what? that follow you, all bro. The, no, dude. That's who you've well, attracted. All, the you guys talk dorks. All you guys yeah. talk crap about the Watchmen. For every DM you get, I get the same ones. You're like, bro, you're so no. right. And the South last taste is terrible. Listen to me. Nah. The very last. Uh, what was the one where they got the? It was a DC Comics one where they got a bunch of bad guys. Watchmen, right? No. Justice League? No, it wasn't Justice League. It was like the- Both those are terrible. No, it was- They got a bunch of bad guys together to to go fight crime, and they pulled them out of jail to do it. And, uh, oh, anyway. Oh, that movie sucked. Anyway, it was- <laughs> What is it? Yeah. Suicide yeah, Squad. Oh, yeah. The another, last, another bad listen, one. Terrible. The original one sucked. The last one was hilarious. Oh, they, see, yeah, it I was the original one was okay. The second one was terrible. Anyway, it got great ratings. Okay. This is what, Rotten Tomato, great ratings. So anyway- <laughs> 
He's a character in there. people who fill out ratings. So anyway, it's a series uh, based off of his his character. And it's the he's like the weirdest kind of like superhero. He's got strange. It's pure comedy. But anyway, there's some scenes where he's just walking around in his underwear. Yeah. And I told Jessica as we're, you know, as he comes on, I'm like, you know, that guy's a massive, like genetic freak. I'm like, you should see videos of oh, that his guy. his hands are insane. When he was a wrestler Who, as a kid. Cena? Yeah. Cena, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know much of his and, history. Yeah. It, well, oh, dude, he was a, he's, he's a beast. The guy's, yeah. he's just a, one of those genetic, like if you knew him in high school, you'd be like, okay, this guy's going somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was talking to her about it and there's a scene where he's in his underwear walking around and she goes, holy shit. I'm like, yeah, dude, that guy, I said, that's genetics right there. He trains and everything. But I said, look at the size of his hands. Like, yeah. he's just a moose, yeah. you know? And his head is, like, this big. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. I, big I, our buddy Craig is like that. Craig has got, like, those, like, just neck this big yeah. around. I, I feel like neck and ankles are, like, such a good way to, like, see that. Like, you look at, I got these little tiny, you can wrap my hands around my ankles. Yeah. And my you would have made a good supermodel, I think. <laughs> well, just walking, mm, making that face. You got a good, you. Got Blue a good steel turn. all day, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I, was, I would have made a good chick. Is yeah. that what you oh, You put heels on those bad boys? Let me tell you. Oh, snap. It's, it's gorgeous. Yeah, no, you know, it's funny. My wife has these really long, full calf muscles, but she has small ankles, so it looks good. I told her, I always joke with her, like, if you, I said, if you had bigger ankles, you'd have kinkles. But uh, because man. you have small ankles, your big ass calves look okay. No, you're right. That's yeah. it. If you have the small ankles that go with it, then you're winning. For then you're sure. doing all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, did you guys, okay, so you ready for this? This is wonderful. Did you guys see this study that's making the rounds on. CBDA, so it's so you guys know what CBD is, right? Cannabidiol. Yeah. CBDA is before it gets decarboxylated. In other words, before you light it and you break off the whatever part of the you know whatever the part of the bond, CBDA is what you would get in raw hemp. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there was another form of CBD. Anyway, wait, where are we at with all these like acronyms? Because you have like CBC. Uh, there's different there's cannabinoids. CBDA, yeah. Z. So the, the the main the <laughs> biggest the excuse me the most common or most concentrated cannabinoids are THC and CBD. And then there's lots of other cannabinoids. And then you could, if you heat them up, they change a little bit. If you eat them, they change a little bit. Versus if you smoke them or whatever. Anyway, study shows. That and this made its round. And by the way, this is the second or third study to show this because there was one earlier, like a year and a half ago, that You're I referring to the COVID stuff. Yes, yeah, it prevents the COVID virus from entering the cell. Prevents it. Prevents it from Ooh. entering the cell. Wow. Yeah. Now this was in vitro, so it wasn't an animal or human study, but it makes perfect sense because cannabinoids, but and CBD A and CBD, you're gonna find a lot in hemp. You'll find more in hemp. Than you will in in the marijuana version of because remember hemp there's hemp and then there's marijuana both you know very close marijuana is the one that's illegal hemp is the one that is you know totally legal or yeah. whatever they the CBD and other cannabinoids the reason why they exist is to protect the plant from infections from mold uh, it helps from UV damage and it also prevents bacterial and viral uh, wow. replication so it's wow. got very strong I know, and I've known this for a long time it's got very potent antiviral properties. But now they're showing specifically against COVID. Does application matter in terms of <clears throat> vaping or smoking or ingesting it? I would always eat it. It right. stays in your system longer. It's and healthier. and when you smoke something, it's almost like you're, you're, in, you're inflaming your lungs. And so you kind of negate some of the effects, right? Yeah. But uh, it prevents the COVID fucking virus. Wow, I've, seen, I've seen a bunch of, I mean, people have been sending me like crazy, like all yeah. the articles that are, that are coming out right now. I'll have to remind me to, to message- Rhett and uh, Adrian and see if uh, Ned is like blowing up right now. I'm curious. I was messaging um, Adam said like last night because we've been talking about gyms and our, our yeah. theory on that. Did, oh yeah, did he say that they've seen a big surge? Like yeah. So well, not in California. He says in California. He goes everywhere else. He goes uh, everything's taking off right now. He goes California's still lagging behind because we still have. You're know, lagging on everything. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. we have yeah. stupid yeah. regulations. We, we don't stuff. like to look at new data. Great, no, no, no. great yeah. leadership. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, so he's <clears throat> he, I, but I was reaching out to him talking about that, and they're feeling that also. So I mean, I was telling him, I'm like, yeah, we notice right now it's already starting to happen. Like, nor typically January, especially the beginning of January, is normally slow. A lot of people think that January is amazing for fitness businesses, but it's the first couple weeks it's kind of quiet, yeah. and mm -hmm. we have I interesting. Mean, we're experiencing. Well, the I, I think that cannabinoid uh, based products, good ones. You know what sucks about the market is that you'll buy a CBD product or whatever and there, you don't know if it's got it in there. You don't know if it, what it has in there or how much it has in there. This is why most of them you take, you don't even notice anything. You take it. I don't know. Is it working? Maybe. Mm -hmm. You take like Ned, for example, which is legit. They have third party testing. You feel it. You take it, you actually notice a difference. But my, what I was going to say, my point is, I think cannabinoid supplements 
are going to be one of the most popular wellness and health supplements that we'll see ever. I agree. Because of the broad application. Yeah. It reduces anxiety, helps with sleep. It's got uh, systemic anti-inflammatory properties. It helps with digestion. People with gut issues, they'll find you know benefits. Like I think it's going to be one of those supplements that you're going to see a lot of people just take just to feel better. I yeah. also think it's going to be one of those supplements that uh, there's way more shitty versions of it than there are really good. For now. I yeah. think 80% yeah. will be, well, well, I mean, for there. so long as it falls in the supplement category because there's no regulation. Yeah. There's nobody in there. And it's such an easy thing to- No, I think the market will wash them out. There's I do. A, I think once people, and I know I get messages, people are like, look, I trust you guys. So, and I've tried CBD products before, did nothing for me. I, did, I got Ned. Now I can feel a difference. So I think that the market's going to start washing out. All these crappy. I don't know products. about that. Well, I think it's, it's going to take it's going to take a while before uh, you see that happen. I think. I think it's. I think it's still a too subtle of a supplement to for most people to be able to tell the difference between shitty quality and better quality. Oh, I don't think it's as subtle as you think. I've given it to my grandfather, my aunts, my parents, and they literally they text me now every week. Do you have any more? Can you get me some more Ned? I want more Ned. It helps with my sleep. My grandfather. Uh, Salvatore, I love it. It makes me help sleep so much, you know, whatever. Yeah, so. no, I, I subtle in this, the fact that you're telling the difference between something that has grown incredibly well and is filtered correctly and isn't pixie dust versus someone who's not. Like, yeah. that's where it's going to be difficult. Difference between you taking a placebo and real hemp oil, yeah. absolutely, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. what you're explaining that your family's experiencing is they've got, they've never tried uh, hemp oil before. You give them full spectrum, great Ned, and they, they, oh my God, of course, that. But now give them some product, some knockoff brand that's not very good or that's like got 50% of the potency and maybe they don't see as yeah. much of a difference. Or that's what they'll do is they'll put in there, and I've seen this now, you'll have a CB CBD product for sleep and there's melatonin in there as well. Right, exactly. Or and they'll start doing things like that. Yeah. They, they, I mean, of course they're going to do that. Yeah. I mean, we see that with with all other supplements. I mean, the, that's why I think pre -work, the pre-workout market's the most hilarious to me because the stuff that everybody feels is the stuff that doesn't really do much. Yeah. Like it's the, the least amount of benefit the caffeine. is the stuff that, you're, <laughs> that you yeah. feel that makes you all tingly and you're like, oh, this is working. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay. They put that in niacin, you know, like, oh my God, I'm sweating. I'm so hot. It's like, yeah, yeah nothing magic. Is red. <laughs> Nothing magical is happening right now. They yeah. throw that stuff in there you know what? so the you will feel it. The supplement industry has screwed up a lot of potentially good supplements. Like uh, I remember ectosterone. Ectosterone, real ectosterone does work. Now, I'm not saying it's great for everyone to take. It's whatever. But it actually does work. In a 45-day period, you will build more muscle. It's anabolic and you, re you speed up recovery. But when ectosterone first hit the supplement market, there was the vast majority of companies that sold ectosterone sold garbage. So then it lost. It lost its its reputation. Yeah. And so for a while, everyone's, oh, ectosterone doesn't work. It's crap. Now it's making a comeback because you know more people are talking about some of those old studies and they're bringing out actual quality stuff. But for a while there, I would bring it up and people who were in strength sports and stuff were like, "Oh, I've tried that. It's garbage." It's like, "No, you never really actually tried it." Why don't you think? Shit. Why don't you? Why aren't we seeing like a surge in that? The was it Humanifor that we messed with like years uh, ago? Patented, uh, very oh, limited. Mm. Oh, is that why? Yeah, very limited. That's oh. that's something different, but that's very limited. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it was. So you can't. So some random supplement company can't no. pick up Humanifor. No, you have to go through whoever has the patent for. That particular oh interesting product because I noticed when we messed with that I, I felt it I forgot what that was yeah. called I know that's the it was brand called name. the effects went away real quick yeah, yeah. but, the, but thirty the, days I felt like yeah. thirty days and then I wasn't feeling and then it. gone Even less yeah. for me yeah but, it, but but the the actual name of what's in there isn't that that's the oh brand it's name. not yeah. oh that's the brand name yeah maybe Doug can find out uh, what it's called but it was like some it was an extract from fertilized eggs I believe like there was something eggs? no not dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Dinos dinosaur eggs, so <laughs> rare. Yeah, you ever seen how big a dinosaur? Imagine how is? well that would sell, though. If you, had, dude, I'll tell you like what, I would sell all day long if I was a, If I had no integrity, I would sell breast milk, hundred percent. Breast milk, people I, already do, bro. I know, I would. It's already a thing. I no, I wouldn't sell real breast milk. I would sell a protein powder, and I would, I would say, uh, like we a synthetic version or we, something. Yeah, we we match the amino acid profile and the. All the, you know, it's identical to breast milk. Yeah, well, and they, then here's your commercial. No, you, would, you wouldn't do that because you couldn't do that because that's what they, they've been trying to do that with babies formula forever. Yeah, because you, you, you know shit. I'm talking about the oh, average okay, consumer. So <laughs> I'm saying if I had no integrity. 
Because, hey, think of the commercial, right? You know, the human baby adds 75% of their muscle mass in the first six months. <laughs> yeah. I picture a what commercial. Could possibly I, just, do this? I, I picture, picture a big bodybuilder lady. nursing on a, yeah, on a boob. Like, That's what I picture. <laughs> like this huge super athlete lady, you know, like with just like, like squeezing it in a, in a Hey, hey guys, you want to build mass? Ever wonder yeah. why you were attracted to boobs? Your body <laughs> wants to grow. <laughs> you know, and, and I'll call it best milk. You know what I mean? Oh, best, <laughs> try best milk. Oh. Someone right I, now is like, I want to buy some. No, I seen a, there was a there was a documentary series on, and I, it wasn't just that one. That was one of the episodes, and they. It's, I know. I don't know if it's still a, a, a popular thing, but it, for a minute there, it was getting it was getting some traction. Real breast milk is fascinating. Fascinating. It's unbelievably fascinating. It is the so fact weird. That it changes from AM to PM yeah. is Based wild. On the needs dude. of the baby. Oh, or the sick. The baby's a little sick. Oh, antibodies. Boom. Start producing these. Oh, little you know painkillers. Or oh, if in the PM there's compounds that help the baby sleep. In the AM yeah. there's compounds that help the baby. That's why they'll never wake be up. able to replicate it. It yeah, never. It's, yeah, it's it changes so so readily. It's so strange. It's Very crazy that that people. There's a lot of people that don't don't realize that a lot of people think that freaking formula, well, you know formula a, is, is you know why there's a stigma because uh and this is very hard right first off breastfeeding's hard oh it's uh, ridiculously difficult but second you know there's a lot of women they can't either because they have to work and it's just super impossible or they literally can't they don't produce enough milk and um i could see why hearing all of this would make them feel bad because especially as a mom you want to do the best for yeah, your kids. Yeah, but I hate that we don't talk about it because we're we're afraid we're going to offend somebody who who I agree. Isn't, I mean, because it's it's good information. I agree. You know what I'm saying? And it's and people and some people just don't know. Yeah. Like I, I have family members that have had kids that just just didn't know because they they get they listen to all the marketing and the marketing tells you that like yeah. it's as good as breast milk and so you know and then you then you get to experience the convenience of it and you're like why should we go through that whole process that was difficult yeah. and hard and stressful mm -hmm. it's like let's just give them formula it's just as good now so it's like well no no and it's not it's not me trying to shame anybody who couldn't. But it, but educating to, those that yes. have that option, like the, because there's a lot of people that have that option that take don't take that option because it's not convenient, and I think that for that is the wrong reason in my opinion. Did you know in the '60s and '70s, uh, when formula became really widespread or whatever, there doctors would encourage women to not breastfeed? Of course, because they probably made money off of it. They were told kickback. to not breastfeed because this is better for the baby and it's better for you. You know, isn't that crazy? That's crazy. This is why uh, I know. I know. Look back in time. Has, has Western medicine ever made yeah. mistakes? Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we should, should always we question things sometimes. Hmm. Hey, exactly. Hey, speaking about some of our sponsors, I got a funny story for you guys. I go to get gas. Uh, I had to go fill the car up with gas the other day, and I was a little hungry, so I went in there. I'm looking for snack gas station. Right? There's not that much stuff you can yeah. pick. So you got I'm like beef jerky or nuts. Yeah. That's so I'm the like, only oh, two options. There's this new. There's these yeah, jerky. You're trying to get like ho hos and ding dongs and oh, all that God. garbage. Hell no. Yeah. But I'm like, oh look, there's these meat sticks. So let me try one of these gas station meat sticks. Oh, so spoiled from Paleo Valley. The, yeah. the meat sticks, I cannot yeah. eat any other meat stick. It they hit such fake. a home. They hit such a home run with that. Yeah, way different. But yeah. why we haven't seen them in in convenience? So I feel like that should be like they're the a small next company. Move. I know they're, they're, small, they're small right now, but yeah. it's just like they would murder it. It is so much better than than a lot of those other options that you get there. And, and they're dry. They're uh, they don't have much flavor in them. Like it I, tasted, I've tried a bunch of different. It tasted fake jerkies. and processed. Yeah. as I was eating it, it's got to be so difficult at like a food and beverage company to get into like big stores. I would imagine. I can't. It's yeah. You, I mean, and it, probably most of the companies get big money behind them. And I think of Paleo Valley, I think is family owned, and I think they were bootstrapped. I don't think they took on. I, I don't think. I don't know for sure, but I don't. I, I don't know if they've done any rounds of funding at all, and so mm -hmm. they've just naturally grown. And like when you don't have all this muscle behind you, it's really tough to get into gas stations, Costco. It is because like here's a, here's a scary, not a scary, but a crappy scenario. You're you produce a product, you're trying to grow, Target. Right? How many how many stores does Target have? A thousand in the U.S. Yeah, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, more. And they come even. and they're like, hey. We want your product in all of our stores, yeah. and and you're left with you know that you're you have these warehouses that can only hold this much. Right. You can only produce this much, and you only have the capital to produce a certain amount. You have to say no, yeah. yeah. Or you have to find a way to get well, tons I mean, of even money. Even though that yeah, would even happen, right? So they, that's happen. part of their you know when they ask they'll they would ask that right? Like when you're I, we had a, we have friends right good uh, um, the good wipes they went into Target and they normally will 
Yeah, how many can you handle? You know, oh, we could probably fill, you know, 300 of yeah. your stores. And so they'll do like a trial, like, okay, let's see what happens on the shelves. And if you can keep up, and then if you can, we'll scale up to the the next level or whatever. But I just think it's more like a, a like a you know money thing. If you don't have the capital of to course. go out and produce that much, like then they're, they're not going to- Plus gonna the direct to consumer now is like, I mean, you're cutting out a lot of uh, all those charges of like retail and everything else you have to negotiate. Isn't it wild though, that statistic I shared about brick and mortar? I thought that was so fascinating. Mm -hmm. because, yeah, that's on the comeback like crazy. Yeah, that it, we just had our largest quarter ever, you know, in brick and mortar. And we're still kind of recovering from pandemic time too. It's not like everybody is, I mean, I bet you there's more people now shopping online than there ever were before because of the pandemic and de user sure, yeah. delivery services. Some of the stuck. strong yeah. businesses got stronger. Yeah. After all so, this. but to think that the the brick brick and mortar is still still no. on the rise like that's wild to me. No, no, no. Speaking of uh, of money and stuff, did you guys hear about the new series that's going to come out in Prime? The most expensive series ever produced. You guys want to guess yeah. what it is? Yeah. Well, I know what it is. But, huh. yeah. What? It's the new the Lord, of the, Lord Rings. of the Rings. Oh wow! Yeah, that more than more than Star Wars. The most expensive, the most expensive. TV series ever. Well, they well they well I mean like Mandalorian. They oh yeah, more than that. Yeah, so they bought rights. It's like for five seasons, I, I believe. Mm. Uh, and this is all going to be original content, if I'm not mistaken. Where it's like uh, Tolkien only wrote, you know, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and so this is sort of like so uh, who's writing a this story. That's a good question. I, 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 because you brought you. I mean, I that's was hard. I that's was some big shoes. To telling fill. Katrina yeah. how like you, you know we were watching Boba Fett last night, and I'm kind of telling her like you know I I like watching it with Justin because he gives me all the all the yeah bad, Dave the, Filoni and um um what's his name from Swingers I always forget his oh name. yeah 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 Favreau Favreau masterful job like just because they're you could tell they're super fans and they've they've gone through all of the adjacent books that were not canon and they incorporated the yeah. coolest stuff yeah. right like yeah. and they keep you in that like a lot of the old school fans like myself that are just like still stuck in like you know episode four through six mm -hmm. like that's just where i live so the, they so kept it there oh so they took one of the writers from game of thrones to okay. work aside a couple other writers in developing the new series Okay. I, look, I tell Isn't you it, what. You guys man. notice how you guys notice how movies and and series are completely changing now. Totally. Like we we, we, we yeah. talked about the long form long form concept. concept, you know, because you can binge now and you go back and watch all of them. And you can develop very Some complex money making strategy. You can develop very complex characters. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. It's you couldn't do it before. Do you guys notice in movies how hard it was to make an, a, a likable evil character because you have an hour or two, but now you have a whole series. Mm -hmm. You can make a character be a total scumbag and also likable and also empathetic because you could develop the shit out of them yeah. Yeah. through you know well, and episodes. you and when you build a, something like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings you already have millions of fans already and if you stick to the kind of original storyline and just develop character yeah. they're all interested yeah. nobody's not going to be as long as the character is semi interesting i mean i was just watching boba fett last night i don't i'm not won't ruin it so uh, teaser alert uh, they that the character the the girl that is like his sidekick like I don't know yeah, anything yeah, yeah. about her I've seen her in the Mandalorian and then you see her now yeah but and she's kind of behind the scenes there was a scene like in the last episode where she you know saved his life you could tell she's kind of a badass but yeah. you don't know much this whole last one they they went back you know how every time he goes in that tank yep he yeah. does flashbacks you start to remember so he did a whole flashback on how their relationship formed oh and now right. I'm all super interested in her character yeah. they did that with the the Wookie last time the the dude that the dark one yep like now I'm all curious about his character like it's so I'm like man all, all when I'm watching it all I'm thinking is like holy shit there's a whole nother huge series you know the, you there's know, a whole nother huge but series you know what the formula yeah. is this is why Boba and the Mandalorian did so well is stop trying to create new shit and cater to the large you know, crazy audience that they already yeah. have just give us more of what we that's already what I was understand. saying the, they stick to the original storyline yes. they just build a, they just build a the, character the best example yeah. of that is Karate Kid the the karate kid the new karate kid what is it cobra kai yeah sucks terrible acting terrible story but guess who loves it all the karate kid fans <laughs> i watch all I of love it, it dude. <laughs> because it's always it's a bunch of throwing back to the original karate kid yeah, and yeah. that so that's why i watch it if they tried imagine if they tried to create this whole new story with new characters with the same shitty acting well, they tried and it all flopped never yeah. i would never watch yeah. it all right, so check this out. You're watching Mind Pump. You're obviously interested in your health, but you probably also like the taste of soda. Who doesn't like soda? It's delicious, but it's full of sugar. It's bad for your health. Help makes you gain body fat. Just probably shouldn't drink it if you want to be healthy. However, there's a company called Olipop. 
Now, they make sodas, like the ones you grew up drinking as a kid, that are very low in calories, very low in sugar. Now, check this out. Here's the best part. Olipop has compounds within them that help with gut health. No joke. These are sodas that are good for your gut. And again, very low calories. I believe a can is like 35 calories. So they're really cool in this flavors like root beer, strawberry vanilla, uh, orange squeeze, cherry vanilla. They're delicious. They're good for you. Low calories. So you can enjoy soda, again, even though you're interested in fitness and health. Go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Olipop. And then we have a discount code, Mind Pump. That'll give you 20% off your first purchase. Go check it out. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Helen from Colorado. Helen, what's going on? How can we help you? Hi there, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my question. Um, there was a little bit of background um, in a real fitness and life funk in mid-2019. I joined CrossFit on the premise that all I needed to do was turn up and the coach would make something happen. Uh, and it worked. Uh, one and a half years later, I am in a consistent habit of going to the gym four to five days a week um, and no longer under duress. Uh, during this time, I've been on a journey of discovery for strength, um, and I feel like that's my MO. So in the last year and a half, I've gone from barely knowing what a deadlift is to pulling 300 pounds conventional, and then I squatted 245 when I last tested my one rep max. Um, and most of those gains have come while I've been in a calorie deficit and while, you know, CrossFit, so strength wasn't the main focus. Um, so realizing CrossFit wasn't the right fit for me, I've now moved to a regular gym so that I can really focus on strength and see what I can make happen. Um, so I'm regularly working out four to five days a week. I'm running a three-day lower body, two-day upper body split. Um, and then in terms of nutrition, um, I'm a wee bit fluffy right now. So I'm on a cut trying to get down about 10 to 15 pounds. Um, I'm on 2,100 calories, getting me about one and one and a half pounds a week. Um, working really well with kind of being flexible and whatever fits my macros. Um, so all going good on that part. My question is, in 15 months, I turn 40. Um, with the right training and focus, how far can I take my strength training in that time? Could I hit a 400-pound deadlift in 15 months? And what magic can you guys share to help me go on the right track. Yeah. Okay. So I have no idea if you can hit a 400 pound deadlift. That's more than Justin, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I <laughs> but no, I, I, I have no idea if that's where you can go. Um, I'm sure there's some potential left there, especially because you trained so long with CrossFit, which isn't exactly the best type of programming for pure strength. You're saying you're doing upper and lower body days, powerlifting or strength training tends to focus on lifts, not necessarily body parts. Um, so if, if you're number one, and then you said you want to get leaner, so we got to pick one right now. Yeah. What's more important to you right now, getting leaner or getting stronger? Uh, probably leaner first, um, only cause I'm not really in a position that I want to do maintenance or bulking calories till I've addressed that, um, okay. realistic drop 10 pounds in like, I don't know, six, eight weeks. Okay. So it's I'd focus that on that first. So go ahead and get leaner and, you know, still focus on strength, but don't expect huge strength gains. Not in a deficit. Not in a yeah. deficit. When you're done with <clears throat> getting lean, then I would go in a surplus and I would follow a powerlifting specific yeah, maps power lift. type program. I was mm -hmm. just going to ask, do you have maps power lift, Helen? I do. All right. We'll send that over to you. Follow maps power lift in a surplus when you're done with your cut. Um, and you should see some pretty significant progress and changes. Now I will say this. Your lifts are pretty damn strong now. Yeah. So adding a hundred pounds to your deadlift is I don't know. That's you're you're looking at, you know, a third uh increase you know, adding an additional third to the total weight that you lift. Yeah, that would be you. impressive for somebody who's uh never deadlifted and then begins deadlifting. That would still be impressive. Somebody who has been training CrossFit and deadlifting for years now, uh Adding a hundred pounds is yeah. now that doesn't mean it's not possible. No, no, it's especially I mean, with a targeted powerlifting routine because you know there's muscle that's gained, but but a good powerlifting routine is really good at technique, getting yeah. you good at the lift, and and strength is as much of a skill as it is just muscle. So, I I that would be the best direction to go. I would say, Alan, do you practice uh, mobility uh, quite frequently? Do you have a ritual around that? Uh, I guess, what, what do you mean by mobility? What I mean by that is, um, you know, if you're constantly kind of checking in on your joint health and stability and, and support, 
Uh, so to go through like some of these uh, mobility type stretches and things like, you know, post or even priming before your workouts uh, can make a substantial difference. Also, when you're on your on the this you know aggressive pursuit of strength, uh, you know the last thing we want to do is to um, you know get get uh, you know a, a bad response out of your joints. Um, I, I, I know we're not the biggest CrossFit f- fans, but I feel like that's one thing I really have taken away is, is I do really good priming. Um, I've had really good, I feel like I've had really good coaching in terms of technique. And more importantly, I've kind of been very in tune with if I'm not, if I'm not feeling it, like if occasionally I'll get a tight right hip, I back it off and I focus on that before I, you know, put the weights back on again. Um, and I good. feel like that's a good starting point. Um that I'm whilst I say I'm being aggressive, I'm also being very smart about it. And then obviously listening to you guys, there's no point lifting if it's not good technique and yeah, good mobility. Awesome. No, you're on, you're on the right track. But yeah, the, the biggest thing I'd say is uh, when you're trying to cut, uh, don't expect your strength to to explode. So it's going to be with a surplus, with a calorie surplus. So I'd go ahead and cut first. There's nothing wrong with that. And then go yeah. into the surplus and then chase the strength and then follow MAPS power lift. And that'll be the best. That'll be your best uh, chance. It'll actually, yeah, involved. it'll set you up really nice. I actually think that would be a, a nice little cut to lean out in a deficit, and then the surplus with the changing of the programming. Like yep. if you're if you were doing more of a kind of body part focused program, and then you move specifically to a, a strength based program like power lift, which is the the main lifts. Uh, and you're also moving back from a deficit now into a calorie surplus. I mean, I, I think that's going to set the table for some PRs for you for sure. Um, I think 400 is a very lofty goal, but hey, why not set it at 400 and, and, you know, we'll be happy if we hit 350, you know, I like it. And the number for me is pretty, arb- well, it's arbitrary. It'd be nice to hit, but it's more about the process and what could I really get in that time i don't know if i'll ever get there but it's 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 fun to dream yeah, are, are you a, are you conventional or sumo lifter conventional conventional, oh, conventional. conventional. None, of, none of the sumo crap <laughs> yeah, it doesn't count if it's sumo <laughs> i tell i tell that to lane norton all the time <laughs> no. No. awesome well no thanks for calling in helen i think you know the advice we gave you give give that a shot i think that's your best bet awesome thank you so much thank you helen cheers thank you yeah, I think one of the takeaways here is the conflicting goals that people tend to have. Yes. Uh, I want to build the most amount of muscle, but I'm trying to get shredded. But be shredded. Or, yeah. you know, I want to yeah. be able to run a marathon in, you know, under two hours, but I also want to be able to, you know, squat three times my body weight or whatever. So <sighs> competing goals, it, it, you're better off going after one, unless your goal is to kind of be okay at everything. But if you want to do really good at one thing, focus on that one thing. And then when you're ready to move out, move out. And focus on something else. You're you're, you're going to be you're going to be better off doing it that way that, rather than trying to do everything all at once. Because peeing in a deficit and trying to add 100 pounds to your deadlift after already getting up to a pretty damn good deadlift. Um, I mean, that's going to be a really really hard thing to do. Yeah, a 300 pound deadlift is a very impressive deadlift already. Mm-hmm. So yeah. at 30 39 year old woman, that's yeah, not bad at all. Yeah, no. I mean, honestly, I would be super happy if we added 25 pounds to that in the year. I mean, mm-hmm. 25 pounds to a 300 at this pound, point, right? Yeah. So <laughs> 400, but I like it. You know, seven. you never know though, dude. I swear, um, I've worked with people where they were pretty damn strong, but they never did a targeted powerlifting program. Right. And then they saw huge. Well, I saw. Gains. I mean, when we ran, I dude, ran our pounds. Mat- yeah, I mean, um, Mass Powerlift was my last like maps program that I I, I I ran and was consistent with sticking to the program, um, and because I, I had and why I was so excited about that when we did that I have ever I've never ran like a pure powerlifting program and I saw a big difference from that so I, I packed on some um, some muscle and, and got strong and a lot of that I think is um, just the practicing of the technique. Mm-hmm. of it's it skill. M- more than anything else. Yeah. Like I got, I don't think I was the, built the most, I definitely wasn't the most muscular. I was, I've been more muscular in the past. It's just that I don't think I'd ever followed a program where the, the desired outcome was just purely to get stronger in those four lifts. And I'm just going to get better and better mm-hmm. and better. And it's, it's programmed very well. Our next caller is Steven from North Carolina. Steven, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, how's it going guys? Good. Congratulations on all your hard work. Uh, it's really paying off, helping a lot of people. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read this question off because I don't want to sound like a blabbering idiot, but it mainly revolves around uh, muscle and strength and hypertrophy and the amount of volume that's prescribed in max anabolic. Um, so you hear all these other guys like Lane Norton and Brad Schoenfeld and Mike Isertel preach for days and days about how volume is 
the key for size and strength gains. And they all seem to talk about around a 15 to 20 um, sets per week for any given muscle. Um, but when I'm doing MAPS anabolic, it seems like the most volume you're ever doing for any one body part in particular is 12 sets. And that's assuming that you're doing three days a week. Um, and then in some phases like phase one, it only has like four sets of pull-ups for the lats. But um, anyways, I ran MAPS anabolic as written about a year or so back and didn't really see any significant strength gains or size gains. Um, caveat is I was either at maintenance for most of the time or even cutting towards the end of it. So I'm not sure if that has something to do with it. Um, with all that being said, though, I've been lifting and eating really well for over a year now, and I haven't really seen any size or strength gains significantly, um, doing any sort of program. So I've kind of come to the conclusion that I probably need to do some sort of legitimate slow and steady bulk in order to gain strength and size at this point. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm a little worried that, um, doing so with a program like MAPS Anabolic, I won't have enough volume. And that just worries me. I don't want to get fat <laughs> uh, on my first time really trying to bulk. Okay. All right. So there's a couple of things you added in the question that you wrote into. Do you mind if I go through them? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So you said you you realize you have a little bit of body dysmorphia? Yeah, potentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now that, that can make um that can make being objective a little bit challenging. Right. Okay. Now you mentioned not a lot of strength gains, but you were also cutting your calories. That's common. It's really hard to make strength gains when your calories are low. Um, especially so, an experienced lifter. Yeah, especially experienced. As far as volume is concerned, okay, here, here's the deal with, with volume. And here's the challenge that I have with the science-based uh, fitness communicators. Although they're far better than the typical fitness influencer, they are all about the data and they tend to miss out the context of individual variants because they themselves often don't train lots of everyday people. Or if they do train people... There's a bit of a bias because they'll train just bodybuilders or, or high you know performing athletes. Volume definitely contributes to hypertrophy, but it's got to be the right volume. What does that mean? Well, it's very different from person to person. So that 15 to 20 sets per week, that's true for a lot of people. It's not true for everybody. For, for a lot of people, that's too much volume. And the context that you have to look at is your lifestyle, the stress that you have, your diet, your sleep, and of course, your genetics all play a role. And also... Let's say you did follow a program that, let's say, was at 18 sets per week per body part, and you were doing great, and you did that for years. Sometimes dropping volume gets you better gains when you're stuck to something for so long. And the same is, can be true in the opposite, where you maybe do low volume and then increase the volume. Um, intensity and frequency and all that stuff, these all play a role. And also, don't forget with MAPS Anabolic, there's trigger sessions. So trigger sessions mm -hmm. are a way to add lots of extra volume. You could do up to three of those a day on your off days. So you know, essentially what I'm saying is this. There's a lot of individual variants. You're going to have to play with things a little, a little while. But I'm going to be quite honest with you. The vast majority of people that I've worked with, 15 sets is around the top. Uh, uh, per week, per body part, what most people can can take. The people that handle more than that okay. tend to be more advanced with better athletic or muscle building uh, genetics. Most people are anywhere between nine to twelve sets, in my experience. And again, the context being a normal life and maybe some stress and not everything else being totally perfect. But the other part okay. I want to focus on is the body dysmorphia side. That's going to make being objective really hard. I, I know you're worried about gaining uh, lots of body fat, um, that's going to make it real hard for you to move in the bulk, you know, like to gain weight because you're going to gain a little bit of body fat when you're gaining some muscle. You're not to gain a lot, but you're going to gain a little bit of body fat. So the two options I would have for you are, if you you know, in your question you said here, you're about 13% body fat. You could either cut down to 10% and then go on a bulk or go on a bulk now and tell yourself that you won't allow yourself to get above 15%. Uh, body fat or something like that, and then measure strength and make that the you know the the, the main. And, and the reason why I like strength is because body dysmorphia doesn't doesn't really affect strength. You either get stronger or you don't. And you could look in the mirror and judge yourself all you want, but if the weight's going up, then you know you're doing at least most things right. So uh, that's that's those are the two directions I would say uh, I would recommend you go. So I you know I have a few things to contribute to this. One. Um I actually do agree with Lane and Greg and Schoenfeld, who you're talking about, like uh, as far as volume. Um, if you've listened to the show long enough, you've heard me talk about when I competed, one of the single most important things that I tracked uh, to make sure that I was progressing show over show 
was a volume and how I manipulated that. So, but there's a piece that's missing in this conversation that if also, if you've been listening for a long time, you've heard me say many times, which is my goal is always to do the least amount of work to elicit the most amount of change. So what I don't like about the messaging that Lane is saying and Greg and these guys is we're all assuming that everybody is at the same place, like what Sal is alluding to. And what I have found in my experience is most people um, respond very well to less. Very few people are consistently training day in, day out, months in, months out, year in, year out. Yeah, with good diet, good sleep. Right. Yeah. And so by me, when I start these people off, I actually want to do as little as possible to get them to start to see some sort of change. That way, I have lots of room to increase volume over time. So when I first started to get ready for competing, so I competed for two years consistently. I, I got ready a year before that. So three years of being very, very focused on building, right? And that first year, my routine looked very similar to anabolic. And it was a very slow process of just trying to build my metabolism up, get stronger, pack on some muscle. And what's cool is if you're following maps consecutively, we wrote them in order with purpose, right? So it goes maps anabolic, maps performance, maps aesthetic, and then you would move to something like split, you know, for somebody who's more body body part focused, like a competitor. And all of those, we scale volume in it for you. So anabolic is designed to be the, the lesser volume program in comparison to performance, aesthetic, and then split, and then the pinnacle would be PED. So yeah, you do want to add volume if you want to keep adding. So what they're saying is not not true, but the starting point is really important. And finding that for a, a client is important that you don't go right to the yeah. end. If you try, if I try to start when the, my journey, if I started in PED type of volume, I might have seen great results for the first month or two because of how much volume's in it, but then I would have nowhere to go yeah. and scale. And I would even argue you would have overtrained. Right? I would have. Yeah. I would have. And, and to add to this, Stephen, too, look, look, let's let's think about let's think this out for a second. Okay, adding volume year after year is the way that you get your body to continue to change. Okay, that obviously there's some there's a bit of a flaw there because what are you going to do five in five years or ten years into training? Eighty five sets per week per yeah. body part. It's not always that way. So. You can get up to a certain volume. You could back down on the volume, increase the intensity, change the exercise, all of a sudden get mm -hmm. great well, this, results this is as well. What it, this is what it looked like for me. It went anabolic, performance, aesthetic, split, PED for two shows, back to anabolic. Yeah reset myself again like it's and get what's awesome is after i trained that long that consistently scaled volume over time man when i got back to anabolic and gave myself that adequate rest and brought the volume down i got really strong yeah. so you know the that that's the, the one thing i don't like about when guys pr you know preach this message all the time it's like we're all assuming that you know the millions of people we're all talking to are in the exact same place and again, I'll, I'll always hammer this home. The goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change so I have more tools in my tool belt or toolbox to manipulate later on. And yes, adding volume and manipulating volume is one of the single most important things to adding and building size over time. But where you start is so important. Yeah, and then the, la the last thing I want to say is related to the comment about anabolic. 100% the reason why you didn't see much from that is because you're in a maintenance to a deficit. On a program where it's about building your metabolism and building strength, running in a maintenance or or in a deficit yeah, you gotta feed the body yeah is is i mean the fact that you just maintained would be a success so by running that in a bulk um or at least maintenance surplus is going to be where you want to be in order to see some strength gains and muscle muscle building did, did you do the trigger sessions religiously i did yeah three I a did. day yeah and sorry you did three a day on your off days no i did one a day typically okay. do three a day Mm -hmm. A huge okay. difference, huge difference if you do three a day versus one a day. And make sure you're just okay. you're just trying to get a pump. That's all you're trying to do. Gotcha. The other um, kind of question I had with regards to that is it, that just seems to be kind of conflicting with the, you know, when you want to get better at a lift, do it more frequently um, advice that you guys often give. That's right. Um, so I'm wondering how you would incorporate the more frequency into like random lifts like the All right, so either pull ups or bench press, like just do a couple sets at like 70% for like half as many reps as you can do. Yeah. Think like on the trigger session days. You think of it deal. this way. Think of it this way, right? So if you have you have volume and frequency and intensity. 
Okay, so the more you train, the more often you train, the longer you train, the less you can train intensely. So if you want to practice a lift every single day, you're, you're going to maybe have one day where it's decent intensity. The rest of the time, it's, it's literally practice. Yeah, but don't forget, Sal, this, this if again, going back to what I said, uh, right now, uh, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm sticking to the goal is to build and put muscle and size and strength on right now. Um, you know, getting good at a lift, okay, yes, that, that matters, but we're talking about the vol the conversation right now is about volume and, and properly scaling that. And right now, I want to follow MAPS Anabolic to a T because in performance, you're going to get more volume and practice. And in aesthetic, you're going to get even more volume and practice. And so I, I think the message for me is that, or for you, for me, is that follow it to a T, follow up the right program right after it, let the, let us do the programming for you where we scale the volume in and trust the process and do it in a, a maintenance to bulk so you can actually build while you do it. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, guys. Right. Thanks for calling Appreciate in. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steven. All right. Take care. You know, I want to say this about studies because you are gonna you can pull up lots of studies on exercise. Like how what's the best rep range? What are the best set, you know, range, total volume, and intensity? And there's a couple things that you want to consider when you look at studies. One is that studies are typically 12 to 16 weeks long. So whatever works best in a 12 to 16 week period doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work best long term. The body does tend to lose its, I guess, the the how it adapts or reacts to a stimulus once it's used to that stimulus. So changing things up makes a big difference. And then here's the other part that's really important. If you read the studies, and nobody ever does this, look at the participants. It's almost always 10 to 15 college-aged males, yeah. okay? So let's, look, let's think of the context here. They're young men, so they have typically good testosterone levels. They're probably prime age to build, recover. They probably don't have a lot of stress. They're in college. They have enough time to obviously enroll in a study. They don't have kids. They're not you know worried about all that stuff. So that context mm. matters. So 15 to 20 sets for college-aged males in a 12-week period – that may be true for a majority of those people. If you're a 35-year-old or 45-year-old male or you're a guy with lots of stress or you know, you're a woman or whatever, like it, it changes things quite a bit. And like I said, if I took all the clients that I trained and I considered all of them, uh, 15 to 20 sets is too much for most people. It's usually about 9 to 12 is what I would get out of consistent clients uh, to be optimal. Our next caller is Sarah from Idaho. Hey, Sarah. How can we help you? Hey, um, I love your podcast. Thank you. I've been a frequent listener for over a year now. Um, just a little history about me. I'm 48. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing CrossFit for a couple of years now, uh, but working out probably steadily for 15 years. Just I love weights. Weights is probably my favorite thing. But after doing CrossFit for two years, I feel like I'm not getting stronger doing the CrossFit workouts Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Weird. Um, each workout does have a strength portion, but you are only doing one thing, such as a deadlift or a bench press or a hang clean, et cetera. And then the workout of the day usually uses that strength in part of that with a much decreased weight. Um, but I want to, to throw in some weight days, maybe on the days that I'm not doing CrossFit, but I'm not sure about the cross about the programming because some CrossFit days we're using multiple muscle sets. I don't want to overtrain, but I want to get stronger. I enjoy CrossFit. I know you guys sometimes talk badly about it, but I like it for the endurance it gives me. What would you suggest? I want to be I want to be clear on the the, the CrossFit thing because we do we do tend to tease a lot about it. Like there's a lot of very positive things that CrossFit has be, uh, brought to the fitness community. But your question is the reason why we don't like it because most people have goals just like you have or have specific things that they want to focus on and yeah. that programming there's is a better way to do it. Yeah, there's a much better approach to achieve what you're looking for than following a group class uh that's very intensity based um and Cro that crossfit gets you good at cr competing in crossfit is that what you're trying to do no no i'm i've been just competing in the game of life here okay. so okay so i mean this is the challenge and i get it by the way sarah i, I understand this but it, it's 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 i t when i meet people who do crossfit in your situation not people who are trying to compete in the sport but rather they're trying to improve their health and fitness and their strength and they come to me 
And it's almost like I'm talking to somebody that is in a, a dysfunctional relationship with a partner. It's like they come to me and they're like, <laughs> yeah. hey, you know, my husband throws dishes at me and calls me names, but Stockholm Syndrome. You know, but I love uh, him. I but love yeah, him. we got you know, we're you know, I <laughs> yeah. want to stay with him. So like what it's like, okay, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, you like the throws my CDs. Yeah. I don't want to leave yeah. those. I don't think, and I'm gonna. Uh, I hope I don't make you uncomfortable, Sarah. But I'm gonna. I'm gonna call you out a little bit. I don't think you like the endurance of CrossFit. I think you like the fact that you get beat up in your workouts. I think you like the sweat <laughs> and the pain. Am I? Am I? Is that the? Be honest. Is that the deal? I mean, I do like that. I like. Uh, I okay. like. I call myself kind of an endurance ADD person. Yeah. I don't like to just go out and run. I don't like to just go out and bike. I like to do something different every time. Yeah. So, and because here's why you're you're probably not gaining any more endurance or strength at this point. Uh, the CrossFit program that's different from place to place, and different with different coaches. Some coaches are good, but generally speaking, um, unless you're going to compete in an event that uh, that is CrossFit, there's not a lot of value in comparison to better programmed workouts. So, if you like endurance. I can give you a program that'll give you better endurance. If you like strength, I can give you a program that's going to give you better strength. If you like to beat the crap out of yourself, I think you should stick to CrossFit. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so these yeah. are the things that, that you want to ask yourself. So if you're looking for better stamina and strength and you like that athletic functional aspect and you said you have that endurance ADD, which yes. I get that as maps well. Maps performance all day. We're going to go maps performance or maps strong. Maps strong or maps performance, you're going to have fun. It's different. It gives you some of those components. But you're going to improve. You're going to get. You're not just going to have hard workouts. You're going to see your strength go up. You're going to see your your endurance and stamina improve. You're going to feel good. It's not going to feel like you're teetering on the edge of of overtraining, like you may be feeling right now. Yeah, honestly, mass performance was like our answer to a lot of uh, you know, like it was is actually a good transition for me with a lot of CrossFit clients that I, I used to have, where we would take them through actual functional strength type exercises. And I know that's, you know, that's a lot of the appeal of it is that you're moving in a lot of different directions. You know, it, it's fun because it's almost like you don't really know what to expect. Challenging. Yeah. And, and you're in a group yeah. environment you kind of feed off of everybody. So I totally get, you know, what they're trying to do with that. And they did a masterful job of making it like a community experience. Um, but in terms of like you progressing forward and getting strong, you know, we have to be specific and this is where, you know, good programming actually changes the, all that up for you. So it, it really is just going to revolve around whether or not, you know, you're comfortable enough to, to step outside and, and do something that's, you know, maybe uh, outside of, of that environment. Yeah. Sarah, I'm going to make a deal with you. Okay. Yeah. You can say no. All right. Okay. You, don't, you don't have to say yes. You can say no. If you promise to do what I'm about to tell you to do for at least five weeks, what I will give you is I'm going to give you MAPS Performance, MAPS Strong, and I'm going to give you MAPS Prime because I want to make sure that you prime properly so that you don't get injuries and maybe correct some imbalances you might have developed following the CrossFit uh, programming. Is that a deal? Would you take that deal? I would take that deal. All right, done. Yeah. Done. I'm going to give you all three of those. Okay, so I never give away three programs. I always give away just one. So I'm going to give you all three. Just start with MAPS Performance, okay? Do the first five weeks. If you don't like it, go back to what you were doing before. But if you like it, stick with Mass Performance, then follow Map Strong after that. The entire time you're following both, make sure you prime properly. You'll get that out of Maps Prime. It'll teach you how to do that. And I bet you're going to be blown away. I bet you're going to be like, wow, I, I didn't know what I was missing. The the one tiny thing I, I want- I think that's great. The one tiny thing I want to add, uh, because I've also trained a lot of clients that loved CrossFit and then I ended up coaching- um, is because it, it creates this competitive environment and this kind of go-go mentality. Um, make sure you're following the program as laid out, right? So you'll notice that we have tempo in there. We have rest periods built mm -hmm. in there. And so follow the rest periods as we've programmed them because that's just as important to the exercise It's selection. a part of the programming. So and and I and CrossFit clients of mine have this tendency to kind of go, go, go. And they're mm -hmm. there and they just want to they want to see how much they can do, how fast they can do it, and how much they can get out in that time. And uh, because I know a lot of it's designed that way, where that's not how I want you to train. I want you to get adequate rest. And you know, certain phases, you have shorter rest periods. Certain phases in our programs, you have longer rest periods. And the idea is that when you're in that phase, you stick to it. There's there's science behind why we programmed it that way, and you will benefit from it if you if you stay true to it. And there will come a time when you'll be standing there between sets, and you'll be like. Oh, I'm bored or this is easy I or could be doing like five things. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. I could do this now. Or I could do that. 
<laughs> and you need to fight that urge, fight that urge to want to go right back at it just because you feel like you can. You need to follow the programming, give your body that adequate rest, and then go out again. That's that's my one that's thing that I want to add to this. advice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Is there anything else? Um, you know, that, that's that's it. I I will definitely try this for five weeks, and, and we'll see where we get. Hell yeah. Check, please yeah, check, please back. check in with us. Check back with us. Let us know what happens. All I right. think I know what you're going to say, but think, yeah. do, do it anyway. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, the the uh, dysfunctional relationship people have <laughs> sometimes with CrossFit is so. I love funny. that you called her out on that. Well, I, I, how many times have you heard that? It's oh, a, it's every time. Yeah, I want to get stronger, and but I like the you know I like the performance aspects. I'm like, was your performance improving? Well, no. Okay, what you actually yeah. like is the beat up part of the well, workout. The, you know, the other thing that we call someone like that is cortisol junkies. Of know? course. Yeah, they just they're they just love that adrenaline rush, and she kind of alluded to being somebody like this, totally. where she probably needs. Needs to kind of get after like that to feel the same thing, which which is why I gave the advice I did because I know that same person totally. has a real fucking hard time real hard sitting time. for ninety seconds before the next set. It just feels like an eternity for that person, and if she disregards that and goes right yeah. into it, then she's going to lose a lot of the benefits yeah. of the program. But Otherwise, I, we're just completely going into like cardio with weights. Yeah, yeah and, and, and we got to eliminate that. What I've even told people who had a really hard challenge with this is, I would say, okay, fine. Here's what we're going to do then. We're going to follow good programming for resistance training. And then on these other days, you like that competitive, whatever. Let's find something. Rock climbing or, you know, parkour or, yeah. you know, like do something that. Or start that, a rec league and go speed. Yeah, play, like yeah. That, where, where you, that, that's a part of what you're doing. But don't apply it to your exercise programming because then it just becomes all about the pain. And you'll get away with that for a certain period of time. But at some point, your body's going to rebel. Yeah, I do want to add something too. If she's listening to this, hopefully she goes back and listens to our response after the call. Um, we, you gave her performance and strong, which I think is a very smart transition because it's going to appeal to her the most, and totally. that's hopefully we win her over. But I would follow that up with MAPS Anabolic, yeah. right? So I, I would like to see her go performance, strong, and then I would want to take mm -hmm. her. And hopefully I have in I'm performance. I'm trying to get her. I'm I know. To win her first, I know what so. you're doing. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that I win her over in performance and strong like you did. Like now she trusts us. Oh, my God, I got stronger. I feel amazing. She's going to see all these great results. Then now, now that she has our trust, I say, okay, now you're going to follow Anabolic. And you're gonna have way less volume. You're yeah. only gonna train three days a week. Like you're gonna rest a lot more. Yeah. Just focus on strength. Yeah. Or power lift even, right? So I'd like her to go to power lift or anabolic. So if you're listening and you and you trust the process and you see the great results that you should see if you follow it, go performance, go strong, and then jump back to anabolic and or power lift direction. That's where I'd go. Our next caller is Stephanie from Ontario, Canada. Stephanie, what's happening? How can we help you? Uh so my question's about well, muscular adaptation for performance. Um, I grew up loving long distance running and cycling. Uh, since listening to your podcast about two years ago, uh, I started to incorporate resistance training into my training. So like in high school uh, and university, I, I was a competitive volleyball player, but I didn't really train in the gym very much. I just like ran and biked in the summers when it was um, mild enough to do that. So anyways, yeah, I started resistance training uh, a few years ago and I feel very strong. Like I feel uh, good when I do that. Um, but I'm just worried uh, because I signed up for a half Ironman this summer. I'm worried that my strength gains will be um, like will be weaker because I'm training for a half marathon and I'm going to be biking like 90 kilometers as well uh, in this race. So, yeah, I was just wondering does uh, increasing performance in um, like long distance steady state activities mean that my performance as a volleyball player, so like my vertical jump or the power that I get uh, from jumping and serving and hitting will decrease? I'm just wondering about, yeah, like muscular adaptation. Yeah, good question, Stephanie. Okay, so you you played at a, at a regularly high, at a decently high level in volleyball, right? And you practice pretty yeah. frequently? Let me ask you a question. Let's say you have an athlete that you're coaching who's playing volleyball and they and they practice five days a week and then they go down to practicing one day a week. Are you going to notice a decline in their skill and performance? Um, I would say, I don't know. Like, I think maybe if everyone else on the team is practicing still five days a week and they only do one. Let's say somebody's just training five days a week and they're practicing volleyball and then they stop practicing five days a week and they only practice one day a week. I think you can you can expect to see a, a, a decline 
in some performance yeah. and skill. That's normal. Okay. Yeah. If you're training for an Ironman, you're going to improve your skill and your stamina and your performance specific to the Ironman, and you're probably going to lose some of it in other arenas. And, and depending on what arena we're talking about, you'll see more or less, you know, gains or, or losses. So for powerlifting, you'd see a bigger loss than you would maybe for volleyball. Um, but right. that's expected, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's, in fact, not only there's nothing wrong with that, but it, when we're looking at things long term, it's great to move from one type of adaptation to another back and forth. Whatever strength okay. you lose training for an Ironman, you'll gain back so fast when you switch your training back to strength training. So my advice to someone like you is, first off, like how important- So then, so do you think I should start, oh, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask what you were going to say. Oh, I was going to say, so then do you think like I should do 16 weeks of uh, Ironman training and then right after the Ironman, I should do like a jump training, like a vertical jump training program? I would go specific to Ironman training for however long you think you need for the Ironman. Mm -hmm. After you're done, I would give yourself a couple weeks of deload. So you're, because Ironman's pretty, half Ironman is intense. Um, so yeah. I give yourself a couple weeks and then I would go specific to train for what you're looking for. Now you're not going to lose all your performance cause you're still running, cycling, swimming, you're still moving, but the skill and the specific, uh, type of strength, the specific type of power, you may mm -hmm. lose a little bit because you're training more in another direction. And again, there's nothing right. wrong with that. So if you really want to perform well for the Ironman, focus on the Ironman. And then when you go back to your other training, It'll come back pretty quickly, especially because you have such a good base of that kind of training uh, in the past. The one thing that I would add is uh, nutrition. So where this could get um, out of hand real quick is what happens sometimes someone will, sh they're, they're not focused on building muscle and we're not focused on like volleyball performance. I just want to be good at Ironman. And so it's all about training the Ironman. And we kind of like aren't real, and you're burning so many calories. So you're not, you know, you're not going to put on body fat. So you're not really tracking food so much. And then your protein intake is really low and you are in a deficit a lot of times, and that's going to accelerate muscle loss. So right. the, uh, the one thing that I would add to try and mitigate how much performance slash strength slash muscle that we're going to lose is make sure you're getting adequate calories and protein, especially. So, okay. you know, I would be tracking that and making sure I'm hitting my kind of one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. your body body weight in protein uh, on a daily basis. And then, you know, when I know I'm about to go on like a real long run or ride, uh, loading up, making sure that I have maybe some liquid calories that I can take before. So I've got a, a good amount of, of fuel and energy that my body can utilize. Um, that, that would be the one thing that I would add to try and um, good. Yeah, mitigate how much, because it's inevitable, right? We're, we're switching adaptations and focus. You're going to get uh, yeah. more, you're, you're going to build a more endurance body type, not mm -hmm. a explosive, big, strong, muscular body type by doing that. That's okay. And like Sal is saying, uh, that's going to bounce right back. And it'll bounce back even faster if you do a good job of hanging on to as much of it as you can nutritionally by feeding the body. Um, it'll take okay. you that much longer if you just disregard that and just, hey, I'm running all the time. I'm not really worried about food. I can get away with eating kind of whatever I want, which is what happens to people sometimes who do this. And then they end up eating 40 grams of protein every day. And the body says, oh, we don't yeah. need this muscle anymore. We're just endurance athletes. And so they, it pairs yeah. down. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest okay. thing to consider is just the competing adaptations. So the the more you can go into one versus the other, uh, you know, the more the more efficient your body is going to uh, respond to that and actually learn that adaptation going forward. So, you know, obviously like endurance versus strength, you know, you're going to have both of those are going to compete a bit. So you know, yeah. if, you can, if you can separate those out and, and through periods uh, and like say you're moving then from your, your Ironman to go back, like you'd mentioned, more vertical jump or like, you know, plyometric, you know, explosive type training, you know, just stay in that uh, very specific adaptation for a few weeks. Yeah. Now, here's something you can do the whole time, Stephanie. I think the entire time you should focus on or, or add – an element of correctional exercise to prevent imbalances or injury or movement uh, issues that cause you to lose efficiency of movement. So this will be right. valuable when you're doing the Ironman. This will be valuable for volleyball or anything else you do. Do you have MAPS Prime Pro? I don't, know. Okay, I'm going to make a deal with you. Uh, earlier you said you were a teacher, right? Are you teaching, you're mm -hmm. teaching a class right now? Okay. 
Uh, no, I have a gym class. I'm just on pr- my prep right now. Okay. Are you, but you do teach students? Yeah, I do teach students. Yeah. All right. If you promise not to give them homework today, I'll give you Maps Prime Pro for free. I want to <laughs> hook everybody up. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So we'll send over Maps Prime. I'll let them have a break. Yeah. Beautiful. And tell, hey, say Sal gave you guys a break. Yeah, Sal from Mind yeah, Pump. From Mind yeah, Pump. Right. And, uh, I'll send you Maps. Okay, yeah. I'm going to send Maps Prime Pro to you, and you can use that through all of the training, no matter what you're doing. It'll benefit you no matter what. They actually know who you are because I, um, for their culminating, like their midterm, I uh, made them listen to one of your podcasts about uh, why everyone should deadlift and write a report on it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, there cool. you go. You Beautiful. know, I, uh, one last thing. So we, uh, I don't know if you follow um, uh, PJ, uh, PJF Performance, Paul Fabric. Yeah, I do. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, his vert- I heard you program. talk about vertical. He's so good. I think he's the best in the business. Mm. So if you, if that's a great program, you know. All right. Thanks for calling in, Steph. Okay. Yeah, I'll look into that. Awesome. So then, yeah, just if my goal is overall athleticism, do you think switching between uh, endurance and power-based training is a good way to go? Or, or do you think it should be consistently one of them no, and then just switch up what? If you want general but, overall, then you do a little bit of everything. If you want specific, okay. then you got to be more focused. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank awesome. you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank no you. Problem. Let me tell you, man, I'm winning those students over. Yeah. No, home, no homework for you guys. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's a it's similar question. It's always, we get questions like this all the time. Like, how do I prevent my body from, it's literally, what you're literally asking is, how do I prevent my body from adapting in a way that makes it get better at what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and you, and you can't like, you got to pick one or the other yeah. or be okay with a little bit of all of it. Well, I, you know, it, that's just it is being okay with yeah. that. You're just not going to be the best it. at the the one thing. If you're doing multiple things, if mm-hmm. you're sending yeah. multiple signals to the body, it's not going to be the best at that one thing, which I think is totally okay. Um, if you're not a, professional athlete yeah. or maybe could be like she's competing for Ironman so I would switch all my focus so I can be totally do the best I can at that totally right. and then when I get back then I and then I get back I'm going to be more focused on probably volleyball because that's what I'm doing and then yeah I want to throw some endurance in there every once in a while so I don't lose that you know because I like those things but uh, knowing that the more I do in one way or the, one way or the other it's going to take a little bit from the other one totally look if you like our information head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 